Good morning, everyone. Would you please stand and join us as we begin worshiping in song? <coughs> Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army he shall. sure good to see each one of you. It is good to be back. And I know for many of us, it's been a rough couple of weeks with all this stuff going around, but it is so good to be back. I appreciate all that stood in the stead last week, took care of things. I will, I will tell you, it is not the same watching on TV. <laughs> Just not the same as being here with my church family. And so I want to draw our attention this morning over to Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 4, it says here, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. What an incredible reminder of who our God is and who we are here to worship this morning. Would you join me in prayer? <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we do truly pray, Father, as the psalmist has written here that your holy name would be blessed. In the time that we spend in prayer and in song and in the study of your word, as we give, as we serve, may you be blessed and honored, Father. God, we thank you for the incredible gifts that you've provided that this psalm opens for us. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the incredible benefits of pardoning our iniquities of pulling us out of the pit, of healing, of loving kindness and compassion. What an amazing God you are. And how easily we forget. And so, Father, we pray that again this morning you would renew and rekindle our view of you, our desire to honor and glorify you, and we pray that as we move through this time, Father, you truly will be worshiped, not just with our voices, but from our very hearts. We pray that your spirit would move mightily among this group through this time, convicting us and changing us to be more and more like our dear Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Father, we ask all of this today in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> That's been in vanity and pride Carrying on my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me He died on Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free Pardon there was multiplied to me Then my burden is so from Psalms 103 verse 22 it says bless the Lord all you works of his in all places of his dominion bless the Lord O my soul <clears throat> Yeah. 
winner's chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the role is called a genre.
ushers, if you'll make your way to the front. And as they do, uh, it was good to see and hear from Brother Buddy and Miss Taffy last week. And they made it home after about 40 hours of travel and delays and all kinds of things. But this Sunday morning, they are meeting in a, a new building. And uh, Miss Sandy has got some of those pictures. Look at there. They got a, got a building there. And look at that stage. And then they're working on it getting all the stuff set up and all the cables run and uh and she's got a couple other pictures up there for you and i didn't get to do it but this morning buddy sent me another one and it was of uh miss taffy on the piano and their little music guy playing the guitar and practicing before service and getting ready and just what an incredible incredible work going on there we're so thankful for them and uh, for brother tamay and his faithfulness to continue sharing the gospel and seeing souls one to Christ in Cuenca, Ecuador, and beyond as they begin sending men and women out to share the gospel around the area. Great, great news. Continue praying for them and our other missionaries as they go through uh, this season of illness as well. It's not just stopped here in Texas. It's all around the globe. And just pray for them that they'll be strong, that they'll um, be healthy, and that the gospel continue to move throughout. I'm going to ask Scott, would you pray for us? Father, Lord, we thank you for this uh, chance to be gathered together. We thank you for the freedom we have to be able to uh, sing loudly and boldly of uh, your goodness, your grace, your mercy for us, Lord. We thank you for the freedom to be able to preach your word clearly, Lord. We pray for those churches. Uh, close by and far across the globe do not have that opportunity to preach boldly, Lord, who are threatened with different uh, punishments for that, Lord. Pray for those pastors that they would uh, stand tall on your word, that they would preach your word clearly, that they would uh, uh, be uh, clear in, in all that they're doing, all their teaching, Lord, to be able to bring the gospel uh, unashamedly, Lord. Pray that you would uh, bless our church this morning as uh, Pastor Sam brings the word that he would bring clearly to us. Uh, bless his, uh, his teaching to us right now, Lord. Pray that you bless this uh, giving that we would uh, use your funds, use these funds to glorify you and uh, further your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name. invite you to turn in your Bibles over to Romans chapter 9, Romans 9 this morning, as we continue to study through this incredible epistle and uh, letter written to the church at Rome, preserved for us today to grow in its truth, to gain understanding 
And we enter in chapter 9 now to a new section in Paul's letter. Um, in fact, it, it'd be seen in, in chapters 9 through 11. And <laughs> I can remember years ago um, hearing a, a church was going through the book of Romans and they had gotten to chapter 9 and that Sunday morning where they should have ended there, chapter 8, verse 39, and picked up chapter 9, verse 1, the sermon was chapter 12, verse 1. When asked about it, the pastor said, well, I just don't think the people are ready to hear what's in there, and it's really just an aside anyway. <laughs> um, well, it's been preserved for all these ages, so it can't just be an aside. It can't just be, you know, a little something that doesn't really matter to any of us today. But that's the thought. There's, there's throughout church history this, this understanding uh, of great, uh, this understanding of great misunderstanding about chapters 9 through 11 of Romans. Uh, there are some who write commentaries or exposit on this, and they all but ignore these three chapters. Others treat Romans 9 through 11 as, as a parenthesis that has just little, if any, connection to the rest of the letter. It's uh, taken as an aside by Paul, where he expresses some personal concerns and insights about his fellow Jews. According to such interpretations and, and according to such comments, the central message of justification by faith is interrupted here in chapter 9, verse 1. It doesn't pick up again till chapter 12, verse 1. However, what we'll find as we study through these three chapters is that they are intricately related to the rest of the letter. They're, they're paramount. They're, they're, they're definitely a considered part, a planned out portion, inspired by the Holy Spirit for Paul to write, to be preserved to, to, to today for us as well. Both John MacArthur and John Murray and their comments on this convey that Paul did not want to continue his teaching on justification without first clearing up some related truths regarding Israel and the Israelites. In these three chapters, Paul contradicts some of the prevailing falsehoods over which many Christians, especially those who were Jews, were stumbling over. See, because the gospel is clear, because the gospel clearly tells that both Jews and Gentiles are saved by faith, the Jewish people would have to turn from their trust in their own religious achievements. The, they would have to humble themselves. They would have to reject the intimidating pressure of the traditions in which they lived. And they rejected this very gospel in the Messiah. In this section of the letter, Paul shows that the nation of Israel has been temporarily set aside by God because of her continued rebellion and unbelief, especially her rejection of the Messiah, right? Of all that should have known. <laughs> and we looked at over the Christmas time, that message that came, right? You would have, these folks should have been on the edge of their seats. They should have been so prepared. And yet Christ makes an entrance barely noticed by anyone. And as he lives through his life and as his, his public ministry goes about, he's rejected, he's scoffed, he's called a blasphemer, he's called a, 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 a member of Satan's team. Demon-possessed, they would even say. Those who should have known rejected him. And so as Paul writes here, it's as though he... He comes to this incredible concluding statement of chapter 8, right? What could separate us? No one and no thing. <laughs> but then it's like chapters 9 through 11 are almost like a cloud comes over and Paul is just grieved by his countrymen, by their lack of faith, by their rebellion, by their 
indifference. And so as we open into chapter 9, we get a glimpse of Paul's heart for the Jewish people. Paul's an incredible soul winner. And you see the title is A Soul Winner's Heart. We see his heart here. And, and we see a need to have a heart like this as we deal with the lost around us. See, all soul winners have a deep passion for the lost. There's this tremendous anguish of our hearts for the lost, which causes us to exchange life of the flesh for the opportunity to share the way of eternal life. And though Paul was sent to the Gentiles, he never lost his longing to see Jews saved. And this is where we begin to open up into. So stand with me in honor of God's word this morning. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, a soul winner's heart. It says here, I am telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is overall God blessed forever. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we thank you that you have woven scripture together to fulfill your plan, to convey your message and your truth to the original writers and hearers and to us today that we might live according to your truth. And so, Father, we pray today that you would guide us in this study, that you would guide us in our time, that you will be honored and glorified as only you ought to be, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And so we find here, right, heading straight out of chapter 8, where we're jumping for joy, we're we're throwing our hands in the air, we're we're pumping our fists, yes, Lord, yes, thank you, to this sudden somber opening of chapter 9, verse 1. But we find it here a couple of points, and the first one is, a passion for the lost. A soul winner's heart has a passion for the lost. There's a desire to see soul saved. Oh, we see that with Paul here. It's clear. Right? Well, he tells us from chapter 1 to chapter 8, this incredible news of what God has done on our behalf, sending his son as a propitiation, as the wrath-bearing sacrifice offering for our sin and offense against God. He then thinks back to his countrymen, his kinsmen in the flesh, it tells us here, to consider them and their need for the truth, their need to understand the truth. And so as he considers this incredible salvation There's this burden for men and women right next to him. There's a burden for those he grew up with, for those he was in synagogue with, for those that he sat under teachers and learned with. And so chapters 9 through 11, as I mentioned earlier, are like a cloud that pass over his rejoicing from chapter 8 as he contemplates Israel's rejection of the Lord. And in this expression of deep sorrow, Paul declares his love for the people. He's just presented eight incredible chapters of divine truth that are thrilling to those who believe, but devastating to unbelievers, especially, particularly unbelieving Jews who felt completely secure in what their ritual heritage their legalistic performance of ceremonies and their adherence to rabbinical tradition. 
right? He's already talked about that even. That stuff doesn't amount to anything without a relationship with Christ. And so for an unbelieving Jew to take Paul's words seriously would leave them to feel as though the gospel rendered them utterly outcast, written off by God. And so Paul has not just a great concern for the nation, but for individuals. Before before these people were going to listen to anything he had to say, they first would have to know that he truly cared for them, that he wasn't just leading some anti-Jew movement, right? That he had a care and a concern for them. He's not just bringing them a message to condemn and destroy them, but he's coming as a friend with the gospel, (coughs) desiring to protect them, to rescue them with the truth. Paul had to show them his heart before he could give them his theology. And isn't that true, right? We hear that today, right? We have to be that same way. (laughs) It's not okay. It's not enough to just take the word and just start swinging it above people's heads and hitting them with it. It's like the old adage when we think about evangelism. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right? Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. There's sin all around us. Yes. Do we like it? No. Are we supposed to like it? No. But listen, if we're trying to, to speak with lost people, we need to get to the heart. Don't just deal with their individual sin problem. That's not going to fix anything. We need to get to their heart level. This is Paul. He has a, a passion for these people. Were they living wrong? Yes. Were they following traditions of man? Yes. But Paul says, we've got to strip away to get to the heart. The heart is trusting Christ. That's where change begins to happen. Not just blasting people, not just flying our flag, not just wearing our t-shirt, not hashtagging. I wasn't going to get this excited till later on. (laughs) But you see, the This is Paul. He's sharing his passion here, and he's coming to these fellow brothers and sisters, his his nation, his country. And he doesn't come to them and say, you're a bunch of fools. No, he comes with a passion to them to say, I love you and I care for you. And he gives us three words here that we're going to find in verses 1 through 3 to help us understand this heart of passion that he has. One is he has this sincerity in verse 1. He has this sincerity. He begins by assuring them of his personal honesty and integrity. Look what he says there. I am telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. (laughs) Paul's coming to them going, listen, I'm bringing you the truth. I promise you this is the truth from Jesus Christ. This is it. I'm not lying to you. I'm not trying to embellish the truth. I'm not exaggerating it to try to impress you or entice you to do something. This was Paul's typical mode of operation. In fact, back in Romans chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he calls upon God as his witness there as well. God is my witness of what I'm saying here. And he invokes it here again. I'm telling you the truth. As God is my witness, here is the truth. Here is the gravity of the situation for you Jews. I'm not trying to fluff you up. I'm not trying to water down the message. And boy, we have that going on today by the droves. Water down the message. Make it easier to hear. Make it more palatable. I've heard that. I've read that in books We've got to make the gospel more palatable. What? We've got to make it taste better. How is that being done? Well, by diminishing sin. By by just adding the gospel to what you're already doing that's good. By, By fanning the flame of that little spark of holiness that just resides in you. All this nonsense. Paul comes to say, I'm going to give it to you straight. I, I just want to give you the truth. I don't, I don't care if you know anything else but the gospel. That's what I want to share with you. 
And I want you to hear me. And I want you to to listen to what I'm saying. I care about you enough that I want to share the absolute God honest truth with you. Wow, could you imagine if we had that conviction in our lives today? (laughs) I just want to go to work and share God's honest truth with the people around me. And that's difficult. And I realize that with many of you in corporate world today, you don't get that freedom to just say, God bless you. Hey, I'm praying for you today. But even in that, we're called to have a passion like Paul does here. To have a sincerity of heart that says, I have to share the truth with you. And he goes on. Look, it's not enough that he just says, I'm telling you the truth. I'm, I'm giving you the word from Christ. I'm not lying, but look what he goes on. My conscience testifies with me. My conscience is a witness. Now listen, your conscience in and of itself may not always be a reliable source. (laughs) His conscience was consistently clear. Paul's conscience was uncondemning because he lived a consistent obedience to God. In fact, Acts 23 verse 1 When speaking to the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, Paul says, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. Can you imagine that? I have lived a perfectly pure conscience before God up to this day. So he's saying, what I'm about to tell you is how I have lived every day up to this point. This isn't something different all of a sudden. Right? It's not, oh, I've got I've to stop cussing for the next 30 minutes because I want to share Christ with my coworker. I want him to know I'm being honest this time. Oh, I'm not going to participate in any coarse jesting for this week because next week I'm really planning on sharing the gospel with all the folks and I want them to know I'm different. Well, he says, I've been consistent up to this point. My conscience bears witness of a consistent pattern of obedience to God and his word. See, this is contrary to this common advice to just let your conscience be your guide. Because the human conscience is far from being a reliable guide. In fact, 1 Timothy 4, 2 says that the conscience can be seared. It can be tainted. It can be corrupted by sin. It can become insensitive and unreliable. This is why Paul doesn't, doesn't just say, oh, here, I'm telling you. But no, what he goes on there, look. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. See, a conscience surrendered to God's word is a conscience subject to the Holy Spirit, who Paul points to as this further witness of the truthfulness and reliability of what he's about to say. The human conscience by itself is a neutral thing. It's activated by and according to the nature of the person it belongs to. Right? The conscience of an evil, unregenerate person, guess what? Is given over to evil thoughts and actions and doings, naturally. But the conscience of a faithful believer is reliable because it's been activated by the truth and standard of God's word and is energized by the power of God's indwelling Holy Spirit. When we live in the Spirit, when we walk in the Spirit, when we obey the Spirit, we can trust our conscience because it is under divine control. So there's a question I've got for you. As we think about this sincerity that Paul shares, how sincere are we when it comes to sharing Christ with the lost around us? Like, is that a desire we even have this year? We're we're almost... Halfway through January, well, I guess we are halfway through January, aren't we? I lost a couple weeks somewhere. (laughs) We're halfway through January. And we're going to blink and it's going to be summertime. (laughs) We're going to blink again and and we'll be back at Christmas and thinking about 2023. It just happens so quickly anymore. Are we sincere? Is there a, a heart's passion this year to see souls saved? And listen to me, I don't mean, oh, we're praying for Buddy and Taffy today as they hold their first service in this new building and all the, no, 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 I mean us, I mean you and myself. Do we have a sincerity, a desire to see people come to Christ this year, to share the truth with them? Do we have this sincerity to say, 
I am telling you the truth here. If you don't trust Christ, you are going to die and go to hell. Do we have a boldness to do that this year? The world around us is in utter chaos, church. The world around us has no hope. They have put hope in a whole lot of people and a whole lot of things that are failing them. And naturally, right? They're human things. We have hope in the truth. We have hope of what's to come. Are we sincere enough to want to share that with even our own lost family members, our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends? But Paul goes on, right? He, he displays this array of witnesses because the next statement is so huge. Look at verse 2. And we find his sorrow. I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For what? For these unbelieving Jews. He has this sorrow and unceasing grief. Paul's so gripped by the severity of the issue that it would have ripped his heart out had he not been able to, to proclaim the gospel message to his fellow sons and daughters of Israel. Like, like he goes to bed at night weeping for his neighbors. When's the last time we wept for our neighbors' souls? I mean, again, I, we talked about it yesterday morning. I'm in there with you. I get so caught up with all the other nonsense. I get so caught up with me. When's the last time I went to bed weeping that my neighbor would trust Christ as Savior? And then saying, oh God, give me voice to speak to them. <laughs> wow. I've talked to some of you, gotten to know a few of you newer folks, and, and if some of you are just just outright desiring to win souls. And you talk about you're using every platform you can find to, in, to, to insert the gospel. You're, you're on Facebook groups and, and you then go and have these private messages with somebody that kind of piques your interest and you start sharing Christ with them. How amazing. But do we have this sorrow? Paul says, I have an unceasing grief. My heart is broken. John MacArthur in his commentary makes this statement. Israel's rejection of her Messiah weighed so heavily on Paul's heart that he called on two members of the Trinity to attest to his unrelenting relenting anguish. He knew that Except for God's gracious intervention on the Damascus road, he not only would still be among those unbelieving Jews, but would still be leading them in persecuting those who had acknowledged the Savior. <laughs> you know, that's where the grief came from. It wasn't just that Paul looked next door and went, oh, my Jewish brethren. Oh, I wish they would believe. No, Paul looks and goes, but by the grace of God, I would be one of them. That's you and I. If you've trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, that is our heart. That is our cry. Every, but by your grace, God, I would be as lost as the next guy. But by your grace, I, I would be no better. I am no better than the person I just railed out on in social media. But by your grace, Heavenly Father, I would be just as wretched and lost and despised as the neighbor across the street that screams, yells, drinks, and beats his kids. That's Paul's sorrow and unceasing grief. It's Paul looking, going, who am I to have received this glorious gift who am I to have received this salvation? I was nowhere near worthy. I had done nothing to deserve it. When's the last time we thought on our salvation like that? No, you know what happens in modern America so often for us believers? We sit there going, Psh, we live in America. Of course he has to save us. Look at us. I mean, we all came in with nice clothes today. We all smell good today. 
We're all playing the part this morning. So everybody else knows we're in the right road. <laughs> Paul comes to it, falls flat on his face and goes, oh, God, help me. I don't deserve this amazing grace. I never will. I never have. I never could. And oh, God, help me. Help me share this with the others around me. Having a great sorrow and unceasing grief. Do we have a sorrow for the lost around us? In fact, look, this all culminates. His sincerity and his sorrow culminates into this third descriptive word, sacrifice. I know, none of us like that word. I'm okay, I was talking about it. I'm okay, I was praying about it. But now, wait a minute, you got to give something for it? Sacrifice. Look what he says, right? Here's the question. What would you sacrifice to share the gospel with people around you? What would you be willing to sacrifice? Look what Paul says. I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brother and my kinsmen according to the flesh. <laughs> Paul says, if it were possible to do, I would be more than willing to give up my salvation and eternal life so that the rest of Israel could. Now, Paul knows that's not possible. Even if it was, his sacrifice wouldn't do anything to save him. But do you see the heart? Do you see that heart plays out in Paul's life as a missionary of the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, we read about Paul and we see, oh man, the guy's beaten nearly to death, left for dead, gets up, shakes it off, and goes back into the same stinking city to continue sharing Christ. Because there were others that hadn't heard yet. He's in prison. He's beaten. He's told to be quiet. He's told to stop. And over and over and time and time again, he goes back. You know why? Not because he was some superhero, but because he had an unceasing grief and a sorrow that people would hear the truth. He was so burdened by it. He would have willingly traded his own salvation if it would have meant an entire country coming to Christ. That's hard for me to comprehend. That's hard for, for us to fully wrestle with and grasp. Like, like why we're, we're not even willing to turn the TV off for 10 minutes to go share Christ with somebody. But it's right in the middle of the season finale. Well, the Cowboys are about to win for the first time. <laughs> but it's the World Series. They'll be around in an hour or two. Maybe not. <laughs> we look at the life of Paul and we see the way that he lived his life. He lived it because this was his driving force. Here was a man who up until the road to Damascus was pulling Christians out of buildings, out of homes, out into the city streets, dragging them to officials to have them killed, standing with the coats of men on his arms as he gleefully watched Stephen stoned to death. <laughs> and in this miraculous event on the road to Damascus, confronted by the Savior himself, is radically changed. You think that ever lost on Paul's heart? You think that was ever lost on him? You think it was ever a day Paul got up and forgot the road to Damascus? No. But why is it we're so quick to forget our salvation? Why is it we're so quick to forget that gift that it is truly that a gift and nothing you earn? Why is it we're so quick to forget that outside of God's grace and mercy, we would be lost still hopeless. We wouldn't have hope in the face of this virus that's going around. We wouldn't have the hope that is in Jesus Christ, whether a vaccine works or not, or whether a mandate's going to help, or a piece of cloth, or, or anything of the sort. Paul's willing, if possible, to forfeit salvation. To become a curse, this word is from the Greek word anathema. It's a big word. It's a big word, anathema. It means dedicated to destruction. 
to be pitilessly condemned to utter destruction. Paul says, I would rather to be anathema, destroyed by God himself, if it meant salvation for my fellow countrymen. So what are we willing to sacrifice to see others evangelized? Here's the great news. You don't have to give up your salvation. (laughs) You can't give up your salvation. But what are we willing to sacrifice? What are we willing to give? Paul's passion to offer such an ultimate sacrifice reflects the gracious heart of God who so loved unloving and evil people that he sent his only begotten son to provide for their redemption. Paul's great love for the lost had made him such a powerful instrument in the hands of God. See, evangelism has little effect if the evangelist has little love for the lost. Big deal, right? You're just sharing a message to get done and check a box. See, only Christ's gracious love in the hearts of those who belong to him can produce such self-sacrificing devotion. In fact, we find that the more we obey his word and surrender to his will, the more we will love as he loves. Our men's group is going through a new book, The Whole in Our Holiness. This is what we're talking about right here. As we desire to be holy, as our God is holy, we will desire souls to be saved. We'll desire men and women to trust him and follow him. And by all respects, we'll desire to do it ourselves. We'll cut to the chase. We'll quit worrying about all the non-essentials and the temporaries and get to the eternal things that matter. So a soul winner's heart has a passion for the lost. The second one is a respect for the lost. A respect for the lost. Now, I realize Paul here is speaking of Israel and of the Israelites, but there's application for us today. Hey, church, we're we're desiring to gain an audience with the lost. We're desiring to gain an ear from them to share this incredible truth, to share the gospel with them. It's going to be real difficult to do that when all we do is blast people. Lost people do what lost people do because lost people are lost people. And when all we do is sit on our ways of communicating and just blast how their sin's wrong and their sin's wrong and their sin's wrong and their their king is wrong and if our king was there, our king would make it right. And we just blast and we blast. Guess what they have no appetite for? hearing any of this. Because they're also the people that have seen you lose it with your kids, fuss at your spouse, blow up at work, cut somebody off. Right, he says, there's this respect he has for them. Were they wayward people? Absolutely. Had they spurned all that God had done in and through them through all those centuries? Yes, they had. But they are still a people in need of salvation. And he shares a respect. Listen, we've got to have a respect. We've got to care for them. We've got to move beyond their sin issue into the heart issue. So after he expresses his deep love and his concern, he, he shares this, this respect. And, and really, it's like a, it's a deep sorrow for their unbelief because of their personal connection with God. Look at the two verses there, verse 4 and 5. He, he says, he, of course, he's speaking to his kinsmen of, according to the flesh, verse 3. And then look what he says. He gives eight marvelous truths privileges, if you will, that belong to Israel, that have been graciously bestowed on them by a loving God. 
First of all, the name they were given themselves, Israelites, descendants of Abraham through Isaac, then through Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. That they're Israelites. <laughs> you're not just anybody, you're Israelites. Secondly, then, to whom belongs the adoption as sons? Beyond just a patriarchal ancestry, they are privileged to have adoption as God's sons. As a nation, God sovereignly bestowed on Israel his special calling, covenant, blessing, and protection. But not in the sense of salvation, right? That's individual belief. That's not nations being saved. The Old Testament doesn't refer to God as the father of individual Jews, but as the father of Israel. Sadly, Israel poorly fulfilled their calling, didn't they? They poorly fulfilled wasting their privilege. But this is his line. He's, he's writing this out to them. Look at all that's here, and you've missed it. And he goes on, the glory. They were, they were given the glory, the covenants. They were given the covenants. The first covenant was with Abraham, the physical father of all Jews and the spiritual father of all who believe. Then through Moses, they were given the law at Mount Sinai. Then through David, they were given the covenant of eternal kingdom. It would even be through Israel that God's supreme covenant of redemption through his son would come. No other nation would ever or has ever been blessed with such covenants. They are privileged by being given the law. By being given the law, in the law, Israel not only was taught the Ten Commandments, but countless other principles and standards, the obeying of which honored God and brought blessing to the people. Right, here they are. All of this been given. In, in fact, in Romans 3, verse 2, he says that they had been custodians of the oracles of God. Which would have been not just the books of Moses, but the entire Old Testament. Further the privilege, further the respect for them. They were given the law, that they were given temple service. The temple services. These refer to the entire ceremonial system that God revealed through Moses of sacrifices, offerings, cleansings, worship and repentance administered by the priests and Levites. They were given the promises, the promises of God given to them in distinct and unique ways. You know, imagine having studied all that Old Testament, all those promises of a coming Messiah, and they missed every bit of it. Missed it, rejected it, sentenced him to death because of their rejection and rebellion. Given the promises, then the, they're given, raised up the fathers. This would have been the great patriarchs to begin with, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and on down the line. Leading, culminating, ending here. <clears throat> In verse 5, from whom is the Christ according to the flesh. <laughs> Here's all these privileges, boom, 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 boom. Culminating in the greatest privilege of all, the Savior who came through your line, who came from you. <laughs> Listen, Christ was not incidentally born a Jew, but was preordained to be a human descendant of Abraham and David. This advantage is the highest honor of all the privileges of the privileged. They were given the Savior in their own group. Paul has a great respect for the Jewish people. He's aware of their privileged existence as God's chosen people for so long. He points out this truth. All of their privileges were in preparation of Jesus, the Messiah's coming. And yet when he came, they rejected him. There's this picture of, of the heavenly father and, and his children and, and he, he's done everything he possibly, putting all of it in place. And there's this great grief that comes about 
because they've rejected it. It's kind of like many parents I've talked to in counseling before. Many have provided their child with every chance of success. I mean, look again. He gave them a name. He called them his people. He gave them his word, promises, covenants, ceremonies to be right with him. All of the, all of the word to come. <laughs> culminating in his own son being born among them. And yet through disobedience, rebelliousness, and self-indulgence, they failed to grasp what they were being prepared for. Parents have that. They give their kid everything they possibly can. They take them to church. They share God's word with them. They give them good education. They put them in good clothes. They give them a good car. They send them off to a good school. Tragically, Israel was in this position and they missed it all. They missed the entire purpose. And in closing, this abbreviated quick list that Paul gives, look there, verse 5, according to the flesh, Jesus Christ, right? Uh, the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Huh. Paul's pointing to the divinity of Jesus Christ, his majesty and authority as God. He's telling them, I'm telling you the truth, I'm not lying. <laughs> Here's what all of you are. Here's what you are and, and, and what you were. Here's why God had done all this. All the way culminating to the Christ coming, who is over all who is divinely majestic, who has lordship over all things. He was the supreme blessing, yet you rejected him. Tragic unbelief grieved the heart of Paul, and it grieves the heart of God as well. Does God hate the individual sins in our culture today? Absolutely he does. Of course he does. His word speaks against those individual sins. But even greater than that, what grieves the heart of our Heavenly Father is the unbelief of lost man. Because until they trust Christ as Savior and Lord, none of that other stuff's going to get any better. With all these advantages, with all of God's special blessings, <laughs> these folks still missed it. They rejected him, John 1, 11 says. And because of this, Paul's heart was heavy with grief because of his own people's hardness and disdain for Christ. And it, it kind of brings us right to where we are today. So many of us look out and we're like, oh, our country used to be this and our country used to be that. And it was founded on, it was founded on this word and it was, it was, prom it was, it was supposed to be following all these promises. And where are we today? Well, what are we doing? Well, the majority of us, all we're doing is complaining about it. We're just complaining about the lost people. We're just complaining about how bad they all are, or how bad this guy is, or how bad that woman is. Paul comes to share, hey, yeah, great heritage, awesome, wonderful lineage. Doesn't mean anything if you don't know Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean a thing if you don't know the truth. How about us this morning? Do we grieve over the lostness of man? Do our hearts break? Do we have family members and neighbors and officials and police officers and mayors, potentially presidents and governors, who are lost? Or are we just mad because they're doing what lost people do? How sad. How sad we will jump on the bandwagon of the lost world around us to just ridicule them, to just mock them. 
rather than fall flat on our faces begging God, give us a voice with them. Give us a voice. And God, help us not squander that voice by some nonsense, but to come to them and say, as God is my witness, here's the gospel you need to hear. That might change things. That might turn somebody. See, there are many in our day living right around us who think their family lineage or their religious tradition is going to get them in a right standing with God. There are many who think that simply attending church, being baptized, or giving regularly is going to get them salvation. In fact, there may be some of us even sitting in this room this morning who have been provided every advantage of life, godly parents, church attendance, baptism. However, all of this is meaningless without turning from our sin, placing our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, and following him as Lord. So those two questions to close us out, how concerned are you for those who don't know Christ? How concerned are you? Do you care? I mean, after all, you're saved and going to heaven, right? Do we care? Is there this concern? Are they a priority in our life? Maybe ask myself this question. Ask yourself, am I willing to sacrifice my time, my money, my energy, my comfort, my safety to see them come to faith in Jesus? Can you imagine we saw pictures of this little church in Cuenca, Ecuador that's having church right now? They didn't even have carpet. Y'all, did y'all notice that? Their stage was just plywood and two by fours. They don't care. Because they know Jesus Christ as Savior. Many of them a year and a half ago didn't know him. I was struck by that when I went with Buddy down to Peru a couple of years ago. We sat in a house with about 40 or so adults crammed into a little bitty living room. And about 20 kids upstairs doing a Bible lesson together. And I sat there thinking, man, this is just neat to see a house busting at the seams with people hearing God's word. But then it really struck me when afterward, Buddy said, you know, a year ago, none of those people were believers. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And we come in here every week. And we come in and we go out and we go, many of us are going to go to a restaurant here in just a little while. We're going to eat. And there's a potential a little lost waitress is going to wait on us. But we went to church today. Or we're going to fly past somebody because they don't want to cut us off. We might be late and have to wait in line. We went to church today. I don't know, they're just not getting out of bed. Do we have a concern for these people? Do we have a concern for these lost souls? What are we willing to give up? Paul was willing to give his own salvation up. I am thankful God does not ask us to do that. (laughs) Nor could we ever do that. But I would dare say there's a lot of stuff we could give up. I would dare say there's a lot of secondary things that we need to make secondary for sure so that we can keep the gospel primary on our thoughts and our lips and our actions. So that hopefully this year, in the year 2022, we can be a light and a testimony to the lost world around us for his honor and glory. Let's stand together. I pray that we'll embrace Christ's passion for the eternal souls of men and women. That we'll ask ourselves that question at the end there, what is God calling me to do to reach the lost? What's he calling me to do? Not what's he calling Pastor Sam or Pastor Eldon or Casey or anybody else. What's he asking me to do? Listen to me again. They won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Let's go care for the lost world around us and let's tell them the truth while there's still time to do so. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Lord, thank you for your words. 
<laughs> Thank you, Lord, that, that this passage, these chapters that we're studying now are not some aside or some footnote. Lord, they're reminders for us today that we need to have a passion for the lost, that we need to have a desire and a grieving to share the gospel with the world around us. Lord, we know that we can't die to gain the salvation of others like you did. We thank you for your son and his willingness to go to the cross. But Father, we do pray that through your spirit's help and guidance, that you would give us a self-sacrificing love that cares for the eternal well-being of others more than our own temporary comfort. Father, convict us, break us open. Lord, give us a desire like we've never had to see souls saved, to see lives changed and all by your amazing grace and mercy. For God, it is by that same grace and mercy you saved those of us here this morning who have trusted Christ. Father, may we be held captive by that truth the remainder of our days. Guide us in these moments as we close in prayer and song. Help us to examine our heart before you today. Give us clear understanding through your Spirit's guidance. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> afternoon. Just a reminder that tonight is our fellowship evening. And so I believe it's soup and salad, but as always, we'll eat whatever you bring. And so uh, we look forward to that time to be together. Be in prayer for one another. Many who are still out sick and still trying to get their energy back after um, having this stuff that's going around. And so uh, find ways to encourage them and to lovingly serve one another. Um, also, I'd ask that you keep Brother Gene and Miss Linda in your prayers. This coming Wednesday is uh, the funeral service for uh, Miss Linda's brother, Joe. And uh, he actually passed away uh, the end of December. And it has taken this long to get a date and an opening for this service to take place. So just pray for them. That's a long time of waiting and, and trying to work through all of that process. And so uh, we just ask for you to pray for them and, and uh, lift each other up. Look forward to seeing you tonight. And uh, everything else going on goes back to should hopefully, Lord willing, full normal uh, from this point forward. And uh, again, thank you for those praying for myself and my family as we work through all that illness. <clears throat> it is good to be back.
home. <laughs> and so, uh, visitors, great to have you. And uh, we're dismissed with a song. Let's do that. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift hands, royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army he shall. Oh